Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. In the early days of filming wildlife, as you'll see tonight, researchers had to capture animals in order to observe and learn from them. But that's no longer the case today. Modern technologies such as drones and satellite tracking offer new ways to study animals in their natural habitat with less intrusion, free from human touch. Wild Kingdom set the gold standard for nature programming and introduced generations of young people to the wonders of the natural world. Fortunately, the successful research that began with our original series helped many animals make a comeback from the threat of extinction. And that's good news for the Wild Kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom Welcome to Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. We're in the beautiful birdhouse of the St. Louis Zoo. And this is an open flight cage where the birds are not confined but are free to fly about the building as they wish. One who spends more time out of the cage than in is a tame and friendly toucan named Growler who just loves grapes. Another bird who loves grapes, too, and takes them on the fly is a cock of the rock. <laughs> he flies with such ease and yet with such speed that with our vision, it's difficult to see exactly what happens in flight. Well, of course, we can see the flapping of the wings but we only have to stop and think for a moment to realize that if they were simply flat, plain surfaces, that flapping would never lift the bird off the ground or propel it forward. The flight of birds is so complex and remarkable that it can truly be called the miracle of flight. Now, this little ostrich can't fly, and he never will, because not all birds are equipped for the miracle of flight. However, this young duck will be able to fly just as soon as he grows some flight feathers. But feathers are only a part of the story. For the whole story, let's move into the laboratory where Jim Fowler is setting up an interesting experiment. All set, Jim? I think so. This African Marshall Eagle, as you can see, weighs eight and a half pounds. But look at the scale when you turn the fan on. By simply turning the fan on, three and a half pounds of the Eagle's weight has been taken off the scale. The eagle is lifted simply by the passage of air across his wings. This lift involves that great ocean of air that surrounds everything all the time. As you probably know, at sea level, the air pushes or presses against everything with a pressure of about 15 pounds per square inch. The pressure on the inside of this tin can is now about equal to that on the outside of the can. But let's remove the air from the inside of this can with this pump and see what happens. The outside air pressed on all sides of this can and crushed it because the outside air pressure was greater than the pressure on the inside of the can. 
If I reduce the pressure on the top side of this paper, the pressure on the bottom side will push it up. The faster air travels or moves, the less pressure it exerts around it. This is known as Bernoulli's principle. Therefore, when I blow on the top side of the paper, I reduce the pressure there, and the pressure on the bottom side pushes it up. Jim, let's carry on this experiment a little bit farther and show how Bernoulli's principle works on the wings of birds. Well, a bird's wing is designed so it automatically takes advantage of Bernoulli's principle. If we could see the cross section of a bird's wing, it would look like this. And of course, this is the way we build airplane wings. The upper surface of the wing is curved, and therefore it's longer from the front to the back than this lower surface is fairly straight. When air passes over this, it must come out at the same time at the trailing edge. This gives a situation just like blowing air over the paper, and the faster moving air creates less pressure, and there is more pressure from beneath, so therefore it pushes the wing up and creates lift. With an eagle like this, therefore, you can turn the fan on, and he automatically has lift. And that's exactly what happens in areas where there's almost constant movement of air. Observe the virtually effortless flight of these birds as they circle, soar, and glide. These are albatrosses. Their wings are long and thin, giving them great lift. In areas where there is much sunshine, the air above the earth is warmed and rises. You can even see this rising air sometimes when it whirls and picks up dust. This one in Africa is called a dust devil. The movements of warm air, however, are usually invisible, but donut-shaped like a smoke ring. This is a device for making smoke rings. Air rising like a smoke ring is called a thermal. Soaring birds find the insides of these rising rings of air and soar around in them for hours without even flapping their wings. With their giant wings spread, man-o-war birds ride upwards on a rising thermal until it thins out so much it can no longer support them. Then they glide gently downward until caught in another rising bubble of air, and up they go for another ride. Traveling over an enormous range in search of food, the golden eagle makes good use of thermals. It expends energy to flap its wings only during takeoff, or early in the day before thermals have begun to rise, or when it's seeking a new thermal to ride. The albatrosses are still riding the thermals, but there's one problem here. Eventually, he has to land. When he does, watch what happens. And now you know why the black-footed albatross is also called the goonie bird. The goonie has become so dependent on thermal soaring that it's lost some of the skills of powered flight. got away. This little duck can't fly now, but pretty soon he's going to grow feathers, and then he will be able to fly, because feathers contribute to the miracle of flight. To me, some of the most interesting feathers are those that grow on the very tips of the wings, called primary feathers. The primary feathers have a very remarkable action. Just look at the action of these two different feathers as I move them up and down. The one that's twisting is a primary feather, and this one that's staying flat is a feather found on a bird's back. 
The only difference is that the shaft on this feather is right down the center, whereas the shaft on the primary feather is off center to one side. And because that shaft is to one side, you can see on this model that it makes this automatic twisting action when it goes up and down. And if we stop to think a moment, we can realize that that pushes the air backwards, not only on the upstroke, but on the powerful downstroke as well. So a feather actually not only acts like a propeller, but it looks like a propeller. I think equally remarkable are these other feathers on the wing. These are called the secondary feathers. And they sort of act like a Venetian blind. On the upstroke, they open and allow the air to pass through. Then on the downstroke, they lock, trap the air, and provide power. Well, that remarkable action calls for flexible feathers. And yet that very flexibility combined with the speed of the movement of these feathers in the wings of birds makes it almost impossible to see exactly what's happening when a bird is flying. So in order to further study this question, Jim and I flew his Marshall Eagle and photographed it with a slow motion camera. Our camera was set to record the action at one third normal speed as the bird flew to Jim's arm. Watch the powerful downstrokes and the fast upstrokes. To get a still better picture, we used a super slow motion camera to capture the flight of a golden eagle at one sixth its normal speed. Here you see how the primary feathers twist and turn and force the air backward on both the downstroke and the upstroke. of aerodynamics that apply to the eagle apply to other birds too and to airplanes as well. When men design planes, they design wings of various shapes according to the kind of flying required of the plane, from one as complicated as a helicopter to one as simple as a glider. When man needed a plane to carry heavy loads long distances, he designed one with long wings and broad wings very similar to those of a condor. When he needed a plane to take off very rapidly from a carrier, he designed wings that were short and broad, very similar to the wings of a pheasant. For great speed, the wings are streamlined like those of swallows and swifts. For gliding and soaring, the wings are long and thin, like those of an albatross. Like airplanes, the wings in nature are designed for specific uses. The wings of the bald eagle are structured both for soaring and for power. The wings are motionless as the eagle soars above the water. Watch his great maneuverability as he dives for a fish. A strike and then the power is applied. The seagoing tern flies gracefully on wings that are long, slender, and tapered. But let a tern spot a fish, and it will dive from a height of a hundred feet. Pelicans, too, are great divers. Setting their long, broad, slotted wings at the proper angle, they plummet into the water after food. Falcons have pointed wings, designed for speed. They dive at speeds up to 180 miles an hour. At 
the opposite end of the speed scale are birds such as the American egret that can hover in the manner of helicopters. The red-tailed tropic bird is another in this helicopter class. Yes, it can even fly backwards. The fairy tern can also hang in the air as it maneuvers through the branches to reach its nest. The great man of war bird can hover as well as it can glide. The young birds must be fed, and while doing so, the wings of the parent change shape between forward and backward strokes to continually push air downward, giving it the ability to hover. Truly here is a design for maneuverability. Hummingbirds have the greatest maneuverability of all. Their wings beat 60 to 70 times per second and actually pivot at the shoulder while in flight, making it possible for them to fly forwards, backwards, up or down. The best way to see this action is in slow motion. At the normal speed, the wings beat so fast you can't see the pattern of the wing movement. But here we've slowed the action down over 100 times and each wing beat with the pivot or rotating action at the shoulder is clearly seen. Watching a hummingbird, you're tempted not to believe your own eyes. But it's no illusion. Its maneuverability is just amazing. Hummingbirds are the smallest birds. The largest flying bird alive today is the Andean condor. You can certainly see with these two that there's a big variation in the way birds are designed for flight. They all have one thing in common, and that is the problem of getting from the ground to the air and then back to the ground again. And just like an airplane, the most dangerous moment of their life is when they take off or when they land. I think the condor is a good example of that. We took this one into an open field and filmed its getting into flight. Normally a condor chooses to land and take off from a cliff rather than from open ground like this. When it does take off from the ground, it takes advantage of the prevailing wind to give it lift, just as airplanes do. Since the bird wasn't trained, we held it on an exercise rope with plenty of slack for it to take off. The condor's wings are so large that it can't flap them without striking the ground. So it runs along the ground and creates air movement over the wings to give it the lift it needs. If the air on the ground is still, the condor may not be able to get off. Using this knowledge, South American Indians catch condors by placing bait in a still valley so that when the bird lands, it can't escape without a breeze to help it up. For the record, we measured this giant wingspan at nine feet, six inches. Well, it's pretty obvious this bird needs a long runway in order to get into the air. Well, another bird that needs a long runway is the trumpeter swan. When I was out of the National Elk Refuge at Jackson, Wyoming, I got some photographs of this very rare swan. Here again, the problem is that the wings are just too large. So a long takeoff is needed to develop lift. It's the same technique a child uses when he runs across a field with his kite to get it airborne. There are times when large birds like this Canada goose require long runways for landing as well as for taking off, especially when the landing is to be made on ice.
Look out for his beak, Jim. He can bite. He sure can. Well, these goonies are also very easily grounded, but it's because they have such big bodies and very thin wings. This is a wild one that's just been brought over from Midway by the University of Minnesota Natural History Museum. And he's not going to be able to fly here because there's no air currents in the room. And he actually is grounded on the table. <laughs> Even with those strong winds on Midway, young goony birds have a difficult time taking off. All right, kiddies, today we're going to learn how to fly. First, a few conditioning exercises. Let's limber up those wing muscles. That's right, Wilbur. Have to learn to walk before you can fly. Not that way, Orville. You're a bird, not a kangaroo. That's the way, Wilbur. Run into the wind. Keep running. What's the matter? Oh, no wind. Hey, not that way. You're in the parking lot. Now you've got the idea. You're cleared for takeoff. That's the way, boy. You're off the ground. You're up. You're up. You're down. Well, never say die. All right, Orville, you try. A little more throttle there. Give it a little more flap. Okay, son, you're checked out to solo. All right, now, do you know how to land? Not that way. Land into the wind. Into the wind. Where'd he go? Oh, well. Class meet. Same time tomorrow. This goony bird is one of the world's greatest soaring birds. And in a few weeks, this little duck will join its millions of relatives and take to the air. Its flight will be instinctive. You know, men have always looked at birds and envied them. The greatest minds for many ages failed to duplicate their miracle of flight. And it's only been in this very century that men have moved from their earthbound environment into the domain of the birds into the upper levels of the wild kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com.